Okay. Good morning, um, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, we are uh, lucky to have Amanda Stanton here, Stanton here with us uh, today. She, we are technically done with the academic year, with the fellowship year, but she has graciously agreed to stay and give a presentation after her fellowship. So we're really excited uh, that she uh, is doing this for us. She was the prior fellow at Geisinger, um, and she is currently now in a uh, pediatric private practice doing ped sports medicine out uh, out in Durango, Colorado. So she is going to be talking about a case of a scapholunate uh, ligament injury with a likely concomitant scapholunate joint cyst. So with that, uh, Amanda, I'll watch you rock and roll, and thanks again for doing this. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen here. And we'll pull this up. I just want to make sure everyone can see that. Yep, looks great. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and just happy to do this. Um, regardless of being done with fellowship and for all those new fellows on board, you have an awesome year ahead of you. Uh, and so good luck. Uh, like Ryan said, we'll be reviewing Kind of the dorsal wrist protocol and then diving into this case of a scapulonate ligament tear with an associated cyst. Um, I'd first like to just take a moment to thank Dr. Matt McElroy and Brian Scordone over at the Danville Geisinger Fellowship. Um, they just were so instrumental in their mentorship, um, patience and guidance throughout the whole previous year and also just helping me um, gather some of these images too. I have no disclosures for this talk and Without further ado, we're going to go through this. So this case uh, was a 16-year-old male. He presented to the ortho clinic to our hand surgeons, actually, with uh, right wrist pain. He had a bump noted on the dorsal side. He said he, about a year ago, he kind of fell on outstretched hand. Um, actually, the wrist was in a flex position, so not quite outstretched. And since then, his wrist over the past couple months started to really bother him with a bump on the dorsal side, especially with wrist extensions. Uh, there was no associated like numbness or tingling. He had no other injuries other than that fall that he could recall, no surgeries. And so we have a pretty great relationship with the surgeons and they sent him over to our ultrasound clinic day for an MSK ultrasound prior to they already had scheduled him for resection. Um, of note, there was no documentation of trans illumination, but I just want to point out that that's really a useful tool um, when you're looking at cysts. So on their exam, not going to read through it, but really they saw soft tissue cysts over the dorsal aspect of the radiocarpal joint. Um, it's compressible, it's mobile, uh, and intact neurovascular. So those are really the pertinent positives out of this. And so about a week after he was seen there, he presented to our ultras. Oh, I'm skipping over their x-rays. So of course, you know, their initial evaluation, uh, they did obtain radiographs and I just wanted to include all of them here, um, which when we're thinking about where this swelling, where it's described as the distal radiocarpal joint, um, it's really important to get this lateral view, making sure there's no shift here, um, like what we would see with a slack wrist or something. And we'll talk about that. Um, but overall, you know, the joint spaces are well maintained. There's no obvious occult fracture. Um, these look good. So about a week later, uh, he came to our ultrasound clinic. And just to review, you know, our ultrasound protocol that we follow for a complete evaluation of the dorsal wrist, we absolutely separate dorsal versus volar just because there's quite a bit of structures that you're looking at. Um, Going through, you're going to maintain really in short axis uh, evaluating the extensor tendon. So we know that there's six compartments. Um, up in the top right corner, you'll see the diagram that has them. And for all our fellows studying very much right now, remembering it alternates longest brevis, longest brevis can be very helpful, starting from the radial side. Um, after you evaluate those extensor tendons, you're going to go ahead and look at your different joints. Uh, so remembering to always look at your dorsal radiocarpal, um, here we go, and then also your ulnocarpal. This mid-carpal row, really evaluating, just making sure no fusions, no cysts, um, and then also our DRUJ is important to evaluate too. 
And then as far as ligaments and specific structures, your TFCC is quite a large complex, but making sure you're capturing um, some of that. And then your scaphalunate ligament, uh, which is one of your primary carpal stabilizers, um, you'll want to definitely uh, evaluate as well. Lastly, if you see a ganglion cyst, there's some additional uh, evaluations you can do with your ultrasound just to further help with that diagnosis as there is a large differential for a mass in the wrist and we will go over that too. For us, we tend to use our larger linear probe, um, just uh, higher resolution and then a lot of wrists that are maybe larger. Um, in central Pennsylvania, you get a lot of farmers and laborers and so, the little hockey stick footprint actually sometimes was not as useful as using the larger linear. There is some finesse to doing that. Sometimes you have to use half the footprint, um, but just going through this, you'll notice that we are using the larger linear probe uh, throughout this. And for me, it helped really to keep my dot radial because then anytime I was doing a bio or um, a volar and dorsal exam, just dot radial always kept me oriented. And so you'll notice that throughout as well. So going through how to obtain these protocol images, um, this is down here, this little diagram is your location. Now you can use a little towel roll to kind of help with that orientation, but home base, right? Lister's tubercle off the distal radius here is gonna separate your third and second compartments. And that's really your home shot to know you're in the right orientation. And from there, you can start to evaluate uh, the rest of your compartments here. So remember dot radial over here. So we have our second, third, and you can actually see part of the fourth and not fluid, but actually just low lying muscle belly here. Okay, so going through evaluating each compartment, you're gonna rock staying in that transverse orientation over to the radial side. And your first compartment is gonna contain your abductor pollicis longus and your extensor pollicis brevis. Now this video, we'll go back and replay it another time since they've already started to move. I'm gonna pause it here. And these two tendons can be hard to differentiate. You kind of have to wag that probe to really see your APL is gonna be a lot larger than your EPL. And of what's important here is you're gonna watch them start to migrate because they are going to cross over the second compartment. And this is with our probe moving um, proximally staying in that transverse plane. You're actually going to capture some of it here as we look at that second compartment, uh, which contains your extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. And let's get that to play. So we're focusing here. These are extensor carpi here. And then you actually will see here comes that first compartment coming over. And so this is our proximal intersection that sometimes you can get a little bit of tendonitis in this region. Um, again, this is not fluid, although it is hypoechoic in appearance when you really, we're moving proximal and so we're catching that muscle belly there. So important to distinguish, you can help assist yourself with adding some compressibility or just taking your time scanning back and forth to really see that muscular architecture, uh, which will help you with that. Now, if you do get that um, tendonitis in this area, we all know Diaquervanes is kind of on our, our thought process with that proximal. And let me see if I can get to the next slide. Here we go. All right. And so moving into the third compartment, we get back to that familiarity of that Lister's tubercle. And right here, our third compartment only has one tendon, which is our extensor pollicis longus. And it really will hug onto that tubercle. Now this video, I think, shows that we all maybe don't take the time we need because we go actually proximal and then scan back to that section. So here you can see actually the muscle belly coming in, but this tendon right here, EPL, and then we come back distally right to where we were. What you really wanna do for this third compartment is actually follow distally because this could be your distal intersection syndrome where your EPL crosses over that second compartment distally. And so, Although this is labeled the fourth compartment, I want you to keep your attention here to EPL and you're gonna watch it cross over. And there it goes. Um, and so that is something important to include in your evaluation of that compartment. Now the most probably, I, I always thought the easiest 
compartment to really find was the fourth compartment because you can really wiggle all those fingers, all those digits to see them move. Um, what's important, you have your extensor indices and your extensor digitorum within this group. And so here to isolate them from each other, since they all look like they're in the same compartment, but they do have their separate sheaths, um, you can go ahead and passively flex and extend uh, your patient's finger so you can see that mobility. And so that's what we were doing here to locate indices. And then as we move distally, you are going to see the individual tendons start to branch off into their perspective sheaths as they go distally to each phalanx. Get through here, right about here, you can start to see them separating. All right, let's go to the fifth compartment. Now, this one can get kind of lost because you actually are gonna move more ulnarly in that transverse plan than I feel like you'd expect to in a sense, um, but your bony landmarks really come useful here. So we know that the distal radius is our base and you're gonna move to where you actually see that drop off. And right above that, above that distal radial ulnar joint, you're gonna have your extensor digiti minimi. And so I'm just gonna play that one more time. You'll see us wagging that finger, flexing and extending, and you see this tendon moving up here. Continuing to move even further to the owner side, um, you're actually gonna really toe down um, your probe to really apply some pressure to get your sixth compartment in this nice groove. So now we are on the ulna and there's this ulna groove and our, uh, our model had a little bit of pathology there, but you can see here ECU, extensor capri ulnaris, uh, which is your sixth compartment tendon, is just settled nestled very nicely in this groove. And this will become important as a landmark to come back when you're evaluating TFCC, uh, which we will talk about. So once you've evaluated, those are our extensor compartments. Um, remember, we want to go to our recesses um, and our joints. So, you know, depending on the patient and the quality of images, sometimes we'll get this in one shot uh, where we get the distal radiocarpal and um, ulnar carpal joints just in one continuous long axis shot. But here I broke it down. Um, so this is on the radiocarpal side, just spanning. And we're going from the radial to the owner side and then there we're at the, the edge of the radius here. And then I just have a still shot here of the owner side. Our videos weren't too great um, due to that pathology um, with this model. And so and then your mid carpal joints, you really want to keep this centered and just spanning across that mid carpal row. Uh, you're looking at all those articulations, just making sure um, you don't see any ganglion or hypocoic fluid coming out from there, maybe some arthritis, um, but just helpful for your complete exam to get a shot of that. Now, we already talked a little bit about the radial ulnar joint because you're going to see that when you're going to look for your extensor digiti minimi, your fifth compartment, um, because essentially your landmark is to follow that radius till it drops off and where the ulna comes into view. And so this space here, um, is that joint recess. And this one looks pretty good. And so something to evaluate, especially with some athletes with some injuries there. Um, you want to take a peek at that and dynamically stress it and make sure that this is not really gapping. All right, so moving on to those specific structures in the dorsal wrist, um, our scaphalunate ligament, which is pretty critical in um, our, our carpal stabilization. It is the most commonly injured uh, of the ligaments of the carpal bones. And so you will see an injury to this and I implore you to look for it always. Um, at the beginning of my fellowship, I did not. And after reviewing for this case, I was trying to find more and more of them. Um, and so what you're going to find, it's kind of between the third and fourth compartments are gonna be your landmarks. So part of your fourth is up here and your third's over to the radial side. Uh, and you're going to find your scaphoid and your lunate. It's going to have this like bimodal distribution. And so this fibrillar hyperechoic band that you can see connecting the two, that is the most dorsal part of this ligament. Um, 
And what we're having, why this is moving, what we're having the patient do is actually make a fist and relax. So that's why you're seeing that fourth compartment move because this will actually stress this joint and we wanna make sure that there's not increased gapping there, um, increased space um, as that ligament holds those two carpal bones together. So just again, we're watching this ligamentous area here. And moving on to your TFCC, um, you're going to, what I like to do is go to that six compartment view where you have ECU, flip long on that. So our dot is proximal here. So this is our ulna, we have part of our ECU up here. These are some important landmarks to talk about uh, because you can get tripped up and this may be on our exams. So I'm gonna play this through. You'd think this is your deepest bony structure, but you can see down here, there's a little hyperechoic linear line and that's the shot you wanna get. And probably this is not even as good as it could be. Um, and so what we wanna see, let's get a, just a little shot here. Um, you have your triquitrum, your lunate, and then you're actually seeing the radius down here. And this hole, we know part of the tendon sheath of ECU is part of TFCC. So this whole area and then um, it has its, its meniscus in here, but um, so that is your TSCC shot. So don't be tripped up. This is not the radius, this is lunate and deep, deep down here, you can actually penetrate that through your disease radius. Okay, so that um, ends our protocol. So although it seems daunting at first to go through all of these structures and really evaluate um, them thoroughly, you can see it doesn't actually take that long um, and you can get in a pretty good rhythm. And I think that's why it's important to review protocols and to follow them because it's really gonna help you just make sure you don't miss something and also get more comfortable with all of this. So for our case, we did do a limited. And so we didn't have the full protocol images. Um, and since ending fellowship, I had some issues getting these videos to work. So we have a still shot here. Um, this is our Lister's tubercle. And you can actually see many of the compartments, a really nice delineation here of the second compartment containing your extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. You have your extensor pollicis longus here, and you can see your fourth compartment with your extensor indices and um, digitorum over here. So really pretty shot there. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that because I didn't take this image. So kudos to, I believe, Brian Scorzone. Um, and let's go to, again, I'm sorry that this video, it's not gonna let me play. In our long axis, this is where our pathology came out. So just scanning from long at that distal ulnar carpal and distal radiocarpal joint, we see this large hypochoic collection. Not sure whether it's coming from, you know, radioscaphoid or if it's actually a little bit more distal. And so that's where you wanna start evaluating further and using the rest of that films, um, rest of those clips to kind of help you in that protocol. And so right here, we're gonna just get to the start of this. So home base, we have a little bit of acoustic shadowing behind listers here. We have our second compartment, we have our third and then fourth compartment. And I'm gonna play this once through, maybe twice through, and then I'm gonna kind of slowly walk through it and we can talk about what we're seeing. Okay, and so moving distally, we're in that nice transverse plane right at our home base, we're gonna move distally. As we move distally, we start to see this collection, hypochoic collection, kind of between the third and fourth. So third over here, fourth compartments here. But we also see a separate little collection down here. Now the question is, do they communicate, right? That's what you're evaluating, and most likely yes. To orient your bony structures, you have your scaphoid here and your lunate here. And again, I apologize for the quality of a video of a video. And as we move through, we're keeping in our eye on that hypochoic collection. But you can see here where that nice tight fibrillar uh, dorsal aspect of the scaphoid lunate ligament should be. 
there's some disruption, right? We can see this uh, hypoechoic kind of linear structure coming through and wondering, does this all communicate down since we know ganglions like to come from joint recesses. And so as we scan, trying to keep that in view, we do see that perhaps maybe there was a stalk coming down from that disruption that we saw earlier through that ligament. And all of this fluid does communicate with itself. And so quite a large chest. And then you have a little bit of hyperechoic fo foci within um, that fluid. Again, this has been there for a year and it's most recently been expanding and bothersome for the patient. Um, of note, in this view, we did do a dynamic stress where we had the patient make a fist um, and we watched this spacing here and it did not increase. So we felt pretty confident that all, that although there seemed to be this tear on the dorsal aspect, all in all that ligament and the stability um, was still intact. And so that was important to evaluate for him. As I'm talking about the dorsal aspect, it's like, well, what do you mean the dorsal aspect? Um, this was in a nice surgical literature of just the shape of the scaphoid lunate. So, um, you know, lunate shaped like a half moon, same with the scaphoid lunate ligament, it kind of follows that pattern. Um, and this is that dorsal aspect, which is actually the strongest part of the ligament. It's the one we're really evaluating um, most superficially there on that dorsal view. But you do have a membranous and a volar as well. So I think it's important to realize, even if you see disruption of the dorsal aspect, you may actually still have some stability from the other portions. Now, when we look at ganglions to be thorough with this, you also want to put on some color. Um, and we'll talk about why when we get to our differential. So this is just a still shot um, when we put on the color Doppler that, you know, there really wasn't any increased vascularity within that mass. And then we got a cross-sectional size at the largest area. It's about 2.5 by 1.2 cms. Our case report, um, I'm not going to read this, but, you know, our... our you can go ahead and read it, but really we're saying there is a cyst uh, measuring that size. There appears to be a stalk coming from the scaphoid lunate joint, and there appears to be a partial tear of the dorsal fibers of the scaphoid lunate ligament, but overall remained intact with dynamic stress. And again, this is our limited. So see here, we have extensor tendons, our ligament, our cyst. We did not do, you know, the full, all the recesses um, and everything that we reviewed with a complete protocol. Why vascularity matters, why evaluating a ganglion to be a little bit more thorough. Um, a lipoma can be similar, although not as common on the hands and wrists, but really a mixed echogenic texture here, more compressible and soft. A ganglion, I would say, is a little bit more firm. Uh, infectious tendon synovitis up here, you can see this linear disruption, like superficial to the tendon sheath that has some mixed echogenic foci within it, um, and that you worry, you know, sepsis and, and what's going on in there. Uh, if they have a history of rheumatoid or large family history of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, rheumatoid nodule, and again, you kind of see a little bit of mixed echogenicity as well. It's not that pure black um, uh, hypochoic mass like you would see with a ganglion. With gout, you're going to see some hyper, kind of like little crystals almost. Uh, and then tenosynovial giant cell tumors are actually fairly common and they're very similar. You're really going to see them adjacent to a flexor tendon and they're actually not going to move when you're flexing that tendon as much. They're not necessarily adhered to it. Um, it will not transilluminate. So I think that's important for your exam to know if you're having a hard time differentiating these two. And then again, things to be scared of, you know, synovial sarcoma. This is why x-rays are important. They do have a little bit um, mixed texture as well in there. Whew, I think I got through that with enough time for questions, trying to finish up on time. Uh, some of my references here and ending it here for questions. Great job, Amanda. Um, that was uh, very comprehensive and there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff on the dorsal wrist, a lot of structures to go through. So I thought you did a, a really excellent job. Um, I just have a couple points that I'll make here. Uh, when I'm doing a dorsal wrist scan, you know, just want, you made a comment about the size of the transducer. I actually prefer a smaller footprint for various reasons, but I think, you know, in a lot of folks, just because of the bony contours of the hand and the same deal with the foot and ankle, it just can sometimes be a little challenging. So my personal preference 
um, is, a, is a smaller footprint. And there's absolutely nothing wrong at all with using a larger one. It's just completely personal preference, but that's what I'll tend to do. Um, whether that's, you know, a small linear or, or a hockey stick doesn't really matter. It depends on the patient, but that's, that's my preference. Um, when I start my dorsal wrist examination, I usually will start, um, similar to most other regions, uh, that I scan with a joint and, and the dorsal wrist, I typically take a quick peek at the, uh, DRUJ first, followed by the radiocarpal and ulnocarpal joints in the dorsal synovial recesses. Um, you know, for reasons that we've talked about previously, you know, taking a look at the joint, you can see, you know, effusions or synovial abnormalities and so on and so forth. And I think that can really give you a clue um, into what might be causing this patient's symptoms and whether or not there's any sort of intraarticular pathology. So I'll usually start with that. After that, my protocol is very similar to yours. So, you know, using listers as, as a home base is what everybody is taught. And I think it's perfect because it's easy to find in almost everybody. And then you've got a nice home base. Um, once I find listers, then just like you, I'll go far radial, start the first dorsal compartment and just work my way, um, work my way ulnar. When you get to the far, um, far ulnar wrists, you know, I think it sometimes can be challenging to, if you, if you just have them fully pronated or hand neutral, hard to get around the corner to CECU. So either you can have them really, really pronate their hand and, and get the ulnar aspect essentially facing straight up at you. Or what I like to do is have them essentially with an elbow flex to 90 degrees and elbow on the table and hand up in the air. That will obviously allow you to get all the way around the wrist and will help you if you're doing stress imaging, um, if you're concerned, you know, it's for ECU instability. So that's that would be my preference uh, when I do that. I just find it's easier for me. The, um, the other point that I was going to make with the scaphalunate, so... You know, like you mentioned, starting at listers, you know, fall um, distal and the first two structures you're going to see it escape with the lunate and obviously the ligament uh, connecting the two. I do think it's it's really important when you're looking at scaphalunate joint to stress image this um, in one of two various ways. I think that just that can be helpful to, you know, to assess for stability of the joint. We talk about I was doing a clenched fist view. Um, or radial and ulnar deviation. I've found personally that a clenched fist view is easier for the patient. However, I don't think it puts as much stress through the joint as radial and ulnar deviation. So I think that's probably a better option, but you really, you really gotta coach the, the patient. A lot of them, you know, wanna whip their hand back and forth like they're cleaning a the countertop. And so you gotta say, no, we gotta slow down here because uh, it can be hard to stay on them. So that would be my preferred um, way to stress the scaphalunate ligament. The only other um, structure that I'll mention, um, you know, your the motor branch of the radial nerve, the posterior osseous nerve is going to sit around the fourth dorsal compartment. So that's just something to mention um, when we're talking about a complete examination here. Uh, I think I think those were most of the points that I'm just looking at my list here. Yeah, those are most of of, of my points. Um, Doug, I'd be curious what, what you have to say, um, and whether or not you sneak around to the volar wrist with this, but, um, take it away. Yeah. Nice job, Amanda. Um, yeah, Ryan, I, I'm just going to reiterate a lot of your points here. Um, so I do the same thing. So my dorsal wrist protocol starts with joints. Um, you know, regarding the DRUJ, I've learned over time that, it's really good for assessing effusions, synovitis. It's not very good for assessing degenerative changes. The x-rays are much more accurate than that. In fact, some of the patients with severe degenerative changes may have little change of the DRUJ. Um, so I've learned over time that I need to correlate that well with radiographs. Um, you know, we assume when we take a still image that we've scanned the full width or length of something. So my dorsal joints are at the level of the uh, radius, lunate, capitate, third metacarpal. Um, and the reason why I focus there is that's where you see the dorsal synovial recesses, the proximal and distal dorsal synovial recesses the best. And that's what I want to scrutinize for 
uh, the presence of an effusion or synovitis. And that's the most accurate location to look for synovitis. And of course, you wanna make sure that they're not uh, Palmer flexed um, when you're doing Doppler looking for synovitis because that'll give you a false negative. So again, I, I scanned the full width like you did, Amanda, but then my, my still image is of, of the area of the lunate capitate because then you can visually see the dorsal synovial recesses. Um, and we've talked, you know, a lot about, um, you know, the importance of looking at these joints and, and I love doing, uh, uh, sonograms of the wrist, um, because we can see so much. Um, and, uh, I, I still think that that's a crucial image. You did a nice job of going through the tendons. Um, a lot of good stuff to talk about there, but in the sake of time, um, since we focus on Lister's tubercle, something that's not talked about in the literature is the morphology of Lister's tubercle. Um, and I think the morphology of Lister's tubercle um, relates to risk of injury to the EPL. And so oftentimes people uh, will have a morphology where the EPL sits on top of Lister's tubercle and it has a saddle-like appearance. And I think this type of morphology makes it susceptible to EPL injury with a FOSH injury. And there's something I just noticed over time. So I always look at just the morphology of it just because I'm interested in it and learning from it. Um, Ryan, you had mentioned about the PIN in the fourth compartment and I was gonna mention that as well. There's also an artery and vein. Um, and it's just good to remember that if you're doing a injection dorsally and you're coming in, let's say short axis or transverse, you wanna know where that neurovascular structure is. And then finally, just talk about the SLL, uh, the dorsal scapulonate ligament. Um, yeah, you know, Amanda, your description of the anatomy um, is good. And it reminds us that when you do see a gap, all three of the components of the ligament have to be torn. And so I agree with Ryan that I have found that dorsal and radial uh, deviation of the wrist is much more robust in bringing out widening of that interval than just a cleansed fish. Certainly you could do both if you wanted to, but I always own a radial deviate. And even in older individuals where I'm just doing uh, my normal dorsal wrist protocol, um, if you see attritional changes to the SLL and see widening, uh, I think that's important. Uh, so for example, in my carpal tunnel protocol, I have these dorsal uh, uh, images of the joints as part of it, including that, because if it does widen and you do see an attritional change, they probably have osteoarthrosis in a slack pattern, um, as you briefly mentioned, Amanda, earlier on. And that's that can play into a uh, procedure. So um, I do an ulnar radial deviation and always look for that. I, I also feel uh, in just discussion with our surgeons that ultrasound of the SLL is better than an MR. And the reason why I feel it's better than an MR because we can directly see the fibers and do dynamic studies. So as we know, there's a fair amount of false negatives with MR arthrograms in young individuals through the scaphylunate interval. And so this clarifies it really well in the sense that when you're directly looking at the fibers and stretching the fibers, um, I think that's a much more accurate assessment of potential injury to the SLL. And finally, I mean, I'm not sure there was a partial tear of the SLL. There's certainly a small gap uh, that the ganglion went through and it could have been a partial tear. Um, but I see that all the time in non-traumatic situations where I see a, a cult dorsal ganglion cyst and you'll see it go through the scaphe lunate interval. Um, so um, I'm not fully confident uh, there was actually an SLL partial tear there. Um, but again, I, I wasn't doing the scan and, and seeing the videos, so certainly it could have, but from those images, I'm not sure. And ganglions, of course, are, are you know, so common in this area. Um, of interest, a couple of things. One is that ganglion went above the extrinsic dorsal carpal ligaments. Um, oftentimes, they stay below in occult situations, but in a larger cyst, they go above the extrinsic ligaments. And just a really fine point, when you're doing Doppler, make sure you, you get the full uh, width of the, of the mass you're looking at, because oftentimes vascularity can just be peripheral and not central. 
And so you would miss those. So if you just look at your uh, Doppler borders, they're, they're not getting the edges of that uh, ganglion. So um, just a small point, but it's an important one when you're assessing masses. So sorry, I was long winded there, but uh, lots of good talking points um, because it was a good presentation. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Those are great points and things I will definitely take away. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Those are always, always helpful, always great pearls. So appreciate it. And Amanda, again, great, great job. That was a really great presentation. Um, thanks again for, for doing this. I know, again, you're, you're, beyond, you're beyond your fellowship now and you came back to do this for us. So we all appreciate it. Um, and as anticipated, you did a wonderful job. So thank you. Um, all right, guys, uh, we are, as I mentioned last time, um, we are back again next week. Uh, Charles Kenyon, who's a prior Emory fellow, is going to give a talk on a case of a quadriceps tendon pathology. Um, the, uh, after that, he's, he's actually our last uh, speaker for the fellow section, and then we will get back started with our faculty presentations in August, and we'll get rolling from there. So other than that, everybody have a good Friday, have a good weekend, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you next week.